played with Foreigner on and off for 25 years. <laughs> and yeah. I realized at one point I played, feels like the first time, about a thousand <laughs> times. <laughs> but I realized that for the audience, at least half the audience, that was their first time. So how dare I deprive them of the same experience that the first time I played it? Back to Caffeine TV, Enter Talk. Um, I'm here with a friend of mine who I've only known for a couple years. Just a few years, only 31, 31 years. 31 years. We're yeah, still we're all. still trying to figure out what to call each yeah. other. <laughs> and Mark Schulman, who's <laughs> played with. All right, should I start the list or do you want to start the list of the people? Well, let me that, see how well you do. And I'll, okay. I'll, say. Chair. Yes. Pink. Yes. Um, oh my God. Billy Idol. Billy Idol. Yeah. Stevie and, Nicks. Oh, keep going. I, I just Cheryl got done with Crow. Nam. I got done with Nam. Leave me alone. Go ahead. Simple keep going. Minds. Oh, yeah. Mm, I forgot about that uh, one. Richard Marks, yep. Brenda Russell, yep. Jeff Lorber. Yep. Uh, my gosh, now I'm forgetting. Dave Cause. See what happens when you go to Nam. And I do all these all star gigs with uh, my friend David Pack and then Richard Page mm -hmm. and all these different people. So I, I keep busy. Yeah, you put do. It that way. You but work. I, this is my 13th year. Mm -hmm. Playing with pink. Oh, good. Which is amazing. So that's meshing pretty well, I mean, all around it. T tell me, it was I just... I say it's meshing Yeah, no, well. no, shush. <laughs> I was no, talking, I was I talking with John just on the, on the way here, and we're talking about that you can hear the difference between... Typically, you can hear the difference between a band and a group that's playing behind a headline act. Yeah. When, when you all have been playing this long with somebody like pink, does it start really just turning into a band? It, I mean, it, you really know. It feels like a band. I mean, yeah. we feel like a family, actually. Yeah, that's right. We call I mean, ourselves yeah. a family yeah. because we've been doing it so long. I mean, the newest member is Eva, the bass player, is one of my best friends, and she's been in the band for 12 years. <laughs> so you've been playing so, with 13, and she's yeah. been in for 12. Yeah. She's one of the newer members. And, and Jason has been doing it for 17 years, the musical director. Uh, Justin joined right before I did. Yep. Jenny and Stacy, the singers, joined kind of when I did. Yeah. Adriana was there before I was. Then she left to have a kid, left for eight years, and came back. It and took her Jesse eight Green, years to have a child? Uh, no, it took her eight years to raise her child and come back I'm out on the road. That's what a woman needs to be with a kid. True, you know? yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> Actually, Jesse's the newest member because Jesse joined in 2009. She's a violinist, mm. and she played with the Foo Fighters. And then she skipped a tour, and then she came back as well. So it really is, but the, but there, you do become symbiotic. Right. So I agree. Although we are technically the backup band and the side men, and of course Pink is the artist, mm. we know each other's playing, and then you can do things intuitively because you've been playing together for so long. Right. So it does actually feel like a band. And you have the ability to really, as a band, say, no, we can't do this. We have to change the way we're doing it. And she's cool with that. Yeah, well, she... She knows exactly what she likes. Mm -hmm. So if she comes in and hears something, she will know whether it's right. Yep. And she may not have the musical definition because she's not a trained musician, mm. but we'll know just by having, having known her so long yep. and by the way that she communicates what she wants to change. So you've definitely, you've been playing with this group long enough that you, you definitely have had that moment when you're playing when all of a sudden you're saying, we have changed planes. We're in a different place right now, right? <laughs> you know that well, feeling. Well, there are moments every night there you go. that are so spectacular mm -hmm. that the hair stands on your... I mean, I shave the hair on my arms, but <laughs> the hair <laughs> stands on... That's helpful. ...stands yeah. on end. And I will tell you, with no exaggeration, probably half of the shows I am moved to tears by her performance because... She, you know, we do all this wild aerial stunt. I mean, she mm. knows, she's known for being one of the greatest entertainers because she literally does all this death-defying stuff. Right. But if you take all that away, you listen to that noise. Mm. And when she sings a ballad, oh, my God, it just, it, it just moves you to tears. Yeah. I mean, she's such a spectacular singer. 
So I have those nights, at those those moments every night, and the moments with the band where you're just playing something and it feels so good. You know when you just literally like your, it's like endorphins shoot through your body. Right. And mm. this band definitely creates that for oh. me. And I think it has to do with what you talked about because we've played together so long. You just mm. get these moments where you're just so in sync mm. and it's so wonderful. It's a different and, and, play. And sometimes, you know, like at the end when and Justin, Justin is such a great soloist. And as we've gone on and on, mm. I know he's playing so, so well. Like I can play off of him and it's almost like I can start to read what he's going to do and mm. I can play off the phrases. And even though it's simple pop music, mm. we're still doing some really, really cool stuff. And well, it's exciting. Sim- simple it's, pop music doesn't have to be simple pop music. Well, great. There's an art to simplicity. True. There's an art to making simplicity continue to be engaging. Right. And that's one of the things that I try to teach my students, especially because it's so easy. We were just talking about this earlier to go on YouTube and see all these amazing players and these amazing kids with all these amazing chops. Mm. But to keep something engaging because it feels good, because of the groove, Mm. and to engage people with the simplicity of it, I mean... Pink's songs are are simple. Mm. They're harmonically simple. They're melodically. They're interesting. And I don't want to confuse simple with boring. Good. Right. When I say simple, I mean there's an art to keeping something simple, but Mm. making it engaging and making it interesting. Mm. And what I think that our jobs are as the musicians for her is we take what is on the record and we do our best to bring it to another level. Mm -hmm. As an example, people ask me if I played on the records. Well, I really haven't because the records are all programmed. Uh, so I'm taking programmed uh, drum parts uh, yeah. that are working great on the record because yeah. the production works. It's a style, mm-hmm. and obviously it's working. She's a b- top artist and selling millions of records. Mm. But then we take that stuff, and we had put our own interpretation and our own personality, mm. and we sort of drive it to another level. And she wants that. Mm. Great example. Um, on this record, her manager said, you know, she wants stuff to be a little bit more like the record this time around. So um, when we uh, we came in to uh, learn uh, What About Us. Uh, right, yeah. So What About Us is an example. The drum part, the program part is very simple. It's like... <laughs> so I thought, well, I can play that mm. or I can spruce it up by building it with like some tom parts and then bring a snare drum in on the two and then a snare drum in on the two and the four. Mm. And Justin can, and, and you know, a lot of the guitar parts were, there wasn't like any really distorted parts. So we learned two versions. We mm-hmm. learned one that was like the record. Right. And one that was substantially uh, enhanced Fuller. and, and you know, we, you know the, where the level, the dynamic level really came up. Yeah. So when she came in to hear the band play the song for the first time, we played it like the record. And you could tell she was listening. She'd go, yeah, that's cool. Mm-hmm. And then I was the one that actually stood up and said, well, we have another version, of course. <laughs> and it's the version where we have, you know, the, the guitars are, are get more distorted. We really ramp it up. The drums get bigger. Yep. I'm using toms. And we played that version for her. She said, yeah, that's great. Good. And we, I, we just knew that she was going to like that better. But we wanted to give give the opportunity of sort of emulating the record as well. So I think I think... That's our job as musicians is, um, especially with an artist like that, with production Mm -hmm. that happens to be maybe more simple for us to sort of ramp it up. It's like studio work. It used to be where you'd say, this is the demo that came in. Oh, yeah. And and let's turn it into something else. Well, that's what I do. I mean, you know, so many drummers now, almost every drummer in Los Angeles, every studio drummer has his own studio now. Right. And we get tracks via, and you know, I even did a recording DVD called A Day in the Recording Studio where I talked all about that that. process. Mm -hmm. I receive an MP3, and it usually has drum programming. Mm -hmm. And and what I learned from the drum programming is the basic sound that the composer or artist wants and the basic groove. Mm. But they're sending it to me because then they want me to put my signature and my embellishment on Mm -hmm. it, and that's exactly what I do. So I download it, I have my own charting system, I usually record two or three takes of it, I give them alternate fills, alternate verses and choruses as an example, Mm -hmm. then I upload it and I also give them the samples and I upload it back onto the server in about an hour. Usually takes me about an hour. That's it? Yeah, if it's an average, reasonably simple track. 
more complex. Sometimes I might do five or six takes if I'm inspired. Mm. Sometimes I might switch snare drums or I might switch kick drums and I might give them because I feel like, oh, I'm not sure. You, you might want this or you might want that. I want them to be happy. In my 25 years of doing this, I've gotten one client have me redo a song. <laughs> so I, I got a pretty good track record of reading what they want, but that's what we are hired to do. We are mm -hmm. hired as the musicians to put our signature mm -hmm. and to enhance what they do and embellish it. And mm -hmm. I want them to be happy. I mean, if they're not ecstatic, mm -hmm. and I can tell, you know, then I'm willing to redo anything because I want the my clients to be happy. Man. Well, uh, they are the are you customer. happy? I, I'm just, Mark, I'm always happy to hang around. <laughs> <laughs> but I, well, that's because I brought you that money, Chris. Well, that was very nice as well. I do. Well, that's because I love you. <laughs> Thirty-one years. Thirty-one <laughs> years. It's a long time. It's drummers being different, absolutely from everybody else in the group, right? What are you trying to say? I'm saying we're different. <laughs> but it's one of the cool parts about being a drummer. Absolutely, drummers mm -hmm. are a tribe. Mm -hmm. We are foundational. We love to get together. We do drum circles. You know, you don't hear about a lot about keyboard clinics, but you have a drum clinic and hundreds of drummers show up mm. because we really are tribal and we're communal. And another thing I noticed about drummers is we are so giving. Yeah. Like, it's interesting. Like, if I get together with another drummer and, mm -hmm. and I like a lick he's playing, like, he or she, they'll stop and go, oh, yeah, and they'll slow it down and they'll play it for you. And they, we love to give stuff away. Mm. And... That's one of the most wonderful things about drummers. We're not really competitive. We can all hang. I we can all get along. We all get along. I got a philosophy on that. What's your philosophy on that? Okay, so you're playing an instrument. Okay. And it, it is giving the energy that you ask it to, like a guitar okay. would do. Yes. Or a keyboard will do. Yes. But this is a living instrument, as are you. Yes. And you're playing it, and you've got different tendons in your arms than anybody else. Yes. You have different lengths, yep. you have different ways of playing it, a different approach. So no matter what, three people playing the same drum kit, yep. the same song, yep. is going to be three different ways. Exactly. So there is absolutely no need to be competitive at all. We're all happy to talk, sit down, and just say, let's do this. Yeah, I, and I love that philosophy because it's so true. Because mm. I've often thought about that. If you had, like, me or Abe or Josh Freeze, mm -hmm. or Rich Redman, or David Garibaldi, if we all sat down and simply played the alignment of our limbs, our yeah. touch, <laughs> our feel, where we hit the drums, how we mm -hmm. hit the drums, there's going to be a slight variation, and right. you'll be able to tell the difference. Oh, yeah. And that's the beauty of that would be why, you know, Rich works with he, who he works with, mm -hmm. and Josh works with who he works with, and, 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 you know, I work with Pink. I used to joke with people. I used to say... Because when I was a kid, I wasn't a big Stones fan. And I thought, oh, Charlie Watts can't really play. And as I got older and older and older, I realized, wait a minute, Charlie Watts is the greatest drummer in the world for the Stones. There you go. Can you imagine Dave Weckl playing in the Stones? No. I don't think so. And Weckl is brilliant and beautiful. Mm, yep. But there's also a philosophy that I have about bands. And because I've studied the greatest bands, and I really believe that no great actual band could have had the magnitude of success without any <coughs> or all of the members. Mm -hmm. Although it seems like one person, like in YouTube, you two, you might hear about Bono more than the other band mm. members, but it's the collective energies, mm -hmm. talents, influence, commitment, and mm -hmm. communication that creates the sum being greater than the parts. And that's really what has created the greatest bands, the greatest teams, the greatest organizations on the planet. It really is the combined energies. I mean, your company mm. is has that magnitude of success because of the combined energies. <laughs> well, no, it's just because of you. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in all seriousness, and that's what the whole band and team concept, that's mm. why it's so glorious and mm. so special. It's because you never know how somebody's going to respond to somebody else mm. and how some idea is going to just trigger another idea, right. which is going to trigger another idea. I'm getting goosebumps literally thinking about it. I love this stuff because it's so critical and that's why I, I, I love to engage with other people. And mm. I think it's so critical. That's the one drag I see about a lot of these YouTube stars that are playing solo. Because mm. to me, the most joyful times I've had is not when I'm playing by myself. It's mm. when I'm playing with a band and I'm responding in real time. Uh, what, I talk, what I call active listening. When yeah. you're actively yeah. listening, you're responding in real time. And then you have these amazing things, the surprises you wouldn't expect or the subtleties you wouldn't expect. And that's what happens even when we were talking about what's on stage with Pink. Yeah. We may be playing the same song every night, but there are 
nuances. There are slight differences that just make your hair stand on end because something glorious happens, and it's so magnificent. Isn't it? Yeah. Man. <laughs> yeah, man. And I'm really glad you had that because I always worry about, about people who are, are, are playing, Let's, for lack of a better word, the backup band behind the, the, the talent, right? Yeah. But then you all have been playing well enough, long enough. That's almost gone. You are a band. Yeah. Yeah, that makes such a huge addition. God, I'm glad that you get that. Well, no, no, I do. And yeah. and the, the truth is that the artists recognize that as mm -hmm. well. Yep. And even though the band may not get featured, the artist is affected by the band. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's the artist's choice as to who they're going to hire yep. and who's going to affect them and affect them on stage. And they are responding. Mm. We're all responding to each other. There's a lot of pre-conscious stuff going on, yep. and it might not be that noticeable we might not even be aware of it ourselves, but we are all completely responding to each other in real time. And, yeah. it's, and that's what creates the magic. And it's also the energies and the personalities mm. and what we say and the hang yep. outside of this, off of the stage. Because remember, we're only on stage an hour and 45 minutes. There's a lot of other time. Oh, yeah. How we get along and the interaction and mm. the, the joys that we share, sometimes the tears that we share, yeah. we've shared all of it. Mm. With Pink, you know, with each other. I mean, there's so much... You know, we're, we're emotional beings. Musicians especially are emotional <laughs> beings. That's what we're thriving on. Yeah. So that's what's so critical. It's such a critical part of it. Yeah. And that's that's where you get when that all works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's overwhelming, and it's glorious. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's, like, it's godly. It's like that's the stuff, man. That's why I got into it from the beginning. Because you hear a song. You know, we've all been there. You hear a song, and you're just like, sometimes you got to pull over driving. Or when you mm -hmm. were a kid, you would just kind of stop and go, and you wouldn't even know how to describe how it affected you, but it just affected you. And music needs to have an effect. And I don't care whether it makes you joyful, it makes you loving, it makes you angry, it makes you whatever it makes you, needs to move you. Yeah. And that's what inspires us. That's how we got into it to, to, you know, to begin it, with. Is that Now tell me, not only how you got into music, but how you decided, I'm playing drums. How did that... Well, you know, I, I feel blessed because I feel like... My situation was unique, yep. I, and, and, and I'll tell you the truth. I, you know, I saw Ringo, I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan when I was three on years TV. old, yep. and I remember seeing John and George and Paul, and I remember my brother trying to get me out of the way from the TV. I was standing in front of the TV, and then I saw Ringo, and it was like something resonated. He got a big, beautiful nose, and the way he was sliding the, the cymbals, but I was a drummer. Yeah. And from that moment on, I something in my brain related and just understood it intuitively strangely i sat at a drum set at five years old and i could play wow. i wasn't a prodigy but i knew what to do and i always all i did was want to talk about drums and look at drums and you know i told my mother i want to play drums she said no you got to play a nice instrument like your brother randy he plays violin <laughs> so i was at my brother's violin lesson and i saw this big violin in the corner turns out it was a cello so i started playing cello mm. which is great because i grew up playing cello but then finally they had to honor my persistence and they finally got me a drum set mm -hmm. but i just was always in tune so i feel like drums chose me like it was almost a predestination yeah. like i just saw this four-year-old kid you see that four-year-old kid i did playing all those gospel chops mm -hmm. for me it was like that but it I wasn't nurtured so early, but my parents finally got it. My parents are both college professors, <laughs> and God bless them. I give them a lot of credit because right. my bedroom was next to theirs. <laughs> so they let you know spent hours you know listening <laughs> yeah. to this kid playing drums. But so it, so it was just up to me to practice it. And the one of the greatest things I ever did was I you know I took some drum lessons. I studied with Henry Belson when I was a kid, and then I eventually studied with Freddie Gruber. But I was playing in band since I was nine. Oh, no kidding. Yes. Oh, I started, I did wow. my first professional gig when I was 12. I played with a horn band. So for me, Your first professional gig was with a horn band? When I was 12. Wow. Playing like Chicago and, you know, that kind of stuff. That's amazing. But my point is that I grew up playing with bands. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, practiced and practiced and played in my room all the time, but I couldn't get wait to get out and play with a band. And that's what is so critical about making music. Mm. That's so critical about the the concept. Unless you know, or there are a few people there. Are, there are some YouTube stars, and right. and there's Terry Bozio who puts on a brilliant mm. and very musical solo drum show. But it's also a stage full of percussion, right? And right. it's very musical. 
But for the rest of us mere mortals, you know, <laughs> we want to play with bands. Yeah. And that's what I spent my life doing. And I get hired because I know how to play with a band. Mm -hmm. And then I led my own band when I was 21, 22 years old. And then I understood hmm. uh, even the val even a greater value of playing less as a drummer and mm -hmm. understanding the, the whole more than just the parts and not wanting to play every lick that I knew because I could play a lot of licks. I had more licks when I was younger than I do now. I learned the black page when I was 22, you know. <laughs> but the point is that I learned and I got mature and I realized, well, I can still put a lot of signature on it and I can love it. But I tell my students, man, until you can go and do that for 15 minutes and love it. Yeah. Love every second of the simple groove that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. You need to love the simplicity and then love the juxtaposition of how that part works with the bass player's part and the yeah, guitar player's the whole part feel. and the vocal yeah. and the melody mm -hmm. and the lyrics. Yep. Because if you're thinking about all that stuff, you play differently. It yep. affects you mm -hmm. and you respond. As I said, you're responding in real time. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. And that's why I'm here. That's why I feel grateful I've worked with some of the greatest artists on the planet, but I believe it's because... I really listen and I and I pay attention to those nuances. Mm -hmm. And also my philosophy is that every single note matters. Yeah. I play every well, it note. Does. I play every note like it's the last note I'm ever going to play, like it's like my life depends mm. on it. I, and not obsessively, but just like I really take what I do very very seriously. Well, there's it's this thing, critical. passion. When you're playing, yeah. you got a passion for it. There's a, talk to my kids about what are the things that, that I need to hear somebody be able to have if, if they're going to be a good player, they have to have they have to have talent. Yeah. Like they have to play well. well or you need least, to practice. Or at least you need to they you practice, refine your right? craft. You you have to be able to take risks. Yes. And if you can't take a risk, yeah. you're just playing karaoke. Yeah. And then the other one is you gotta play with passion. Yeah. Every bit of it has to be something that just drains into you. Absolutely. And all and comes out. Man. Well, I'll tell you, I'll, I'm going I'm to extend on that theory because right. my theory goes a level further. I believe there's an evolution of passion because passion can wear off. And if passion wears off, the evolution of passion is purpose because passion is how you play it. Purpose is why you play it. Uh -huh. So what I discovered, um, and it's kind of a joke, I played with Forner on and off for 25 years. <laughs> yeah. And I realized at one point I played, feels like the first time, about a thousand <laughs> times. <laughs> but I realized that for the audience, at least half the audience, that was their first time. So how dare I deprive them of the same experience that the first time I played it. Right. So that's why I decided if every note matters, mm. that means I attach a sense of purpose to every note. If I attach a sense of purpose to every note, then I become passionate about every note. Yep. It's the same way I can play, you know, So What by Pink over 600 times and have the 600th time mm. be as pa passionate and purposeful as the first time. So passion and purpose sort of feed off of each other. Passion drives purpose. Purpose drives passion. It becomes, as Don Pimilaro would say, a, 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 it's a cycle of empowerment. Ooh. Right? You're pulling Dom out. But it, yes. but it is. It's true. It's absolutely. And so that's why yep. I look at every note as mattering, because then I attach purpose. Right. And that's the evolution. So You've been thinking about this. I you? think a lot about yeah. this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a philo 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 philosopher. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're an experienced and good one. So Thank you, sir. Up. As you are. <laughs> and you're articulate. That's why you have your own show. Congratulations, <laughs> by the way. Thanks. <laughs> so, okay. I, I, we've only got a couple minutes left. So I'm going to hit you with just a couple little quick, quick questions. Okay. Top three heroes that are not musicians. Oh, wow. Or let's say top three heroes that are not drummers. Make, well, it, not e drummers. make it easy. Well, I mean, we, there, 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 there are a number of people that I really admire. Um, Gandhi. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yep. um, I'm a big fan. I, I, you know, because I do a lot of what I call uh, activational speaking because I'm a speaker mm -hmm. on the side. I'm a motivational speaker. I admire a, a lot of really wonderful and powerful thinkers. Um, uh, Napoleon Hill, who wrote Think and Grow Rich, right, yeah. uh, Tony Robbins, mm -hmm. uh, Mel Robbins, um, I'm the biggest Paul McCartney fan on the planet. I got a chance to chat with Paul, and he was so such a beautiful spirit 
and we talked about our kids the whole time. And when I was done with the conversation, I walked in my dressing room and started bawling my eyes out because yeah. he was a, a, a bucket list person for me. And just a regular human. And just a regular yeah. human. Yeah, who just happened um, to make gold records. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Um, I've really admired Obama since even before he was president because I read his first book. Uh -huh. um, I the, the list goes on and on and on. Okay. But there are a, a lot of great thinkers and, and, and compassionate people. Um, my uh, the gentleman that's writing my next book on attitude, Dr. Jim Samuels, has been one of my life mentors for 35 years. One of the most high integrity and brilliant thinkers on the planet. And you're getting a chance to work with him now. And I work with him. Well, I've I've been friends with him for 35 years. Oh, no kidding. We talk every week. Yep. And now we're working together because he's absolutely brilliant. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, there's a few. There's a. It few. was more than three, but you know. <laughs> well, I know now we've run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> and Andy Zildjian, of course. Oh. <laughs> No, I do. I admire you immensely because you are a man of high integrity. You're funny, and you treat people well, and you got grace. And so, you're now you're hosting your own show. Just a, a regular guy is what you're saying. Just a regular guy with a beard. I've uh, known Andy since before he had his beard. I was only a couple months in my life. Yeah, I right. think I was before born you reached it. puberty. I you know, it's been a long it. time ago. <laughs> Mark, thanks, man. My brother. <laughs> you're awesome. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it.